Hi, boys and girls. It's Miss Nowacki here, and I have entry number eight with the one and only Bob. So this chapter is titled Ruby. Uncle Bob! Ruby races over, galump, galump, across the broad field that's part of the elephant domain. She's so cute when she runs, like she's determined not to trip on her trunk. Ruby adores me. I make her laugh. I read the room. I lighten the mood. I gotta admit, I am kind of adorable. When I'm with Ivan, I think, pal, we've been through a lot, you and me. We are survivors. When I'm with little Ruby, I think, girl, look at you. Hard luck passed and here you are. So much happier, so loved. Ruby, like Ivan, was plucked from Africa as a baby. She ended up in a circus that went bankrupt, then got shipped off to Matt's mall. Ruby was taken in by dear old Stella. When Stella passed away, Ivan stepped in to play. Well, elephant dad, I guess. <clears throat> I did my part too. Not because I felt like I had to. It just made life easier. Elephant toddlers are a handful. You think humans are bad? Try putting a 200 pound elephant in time out. And this chapter is titled Ruby's Family. Little Ruby seems much more content at the park, surrounded by her new herd. Old and young and in between, they spoil that adorable pachyderm like you wouldn't believe. She deserves every minute of it. Kid had a rough start. Seems elephants hang out in packs of females. Now that she's at the park, Ruby has adoptive sisters and aunts and grandmothers galore. In the wild, the elephant guys head off once they're old enough and do their own thing. Sometimes I lose track of who's who among the elephants because they're always taking mud baths, scrambling their smells. By the way, what kind of animal actually likes baths? Mud? Sure. And this chapter is called Ivan's Art. How's it going, girl? I call to Ruby as she stops near the moat edging the wall. I had cantaloupe for breakfast, Uncle Bob, and it was yummy. And then I took a mud bath. She pauses to take a breath. Do you want to hear a new dog riddle, Uncle Bob? Of course I do, I say, and I catch Ivan's amused glance. What kind of dog is always on time? Asks Ruby. Hmm. You got me, Ruby. I'm totally baffled, befuddled, bewildered. What kind of dog? A watchdog, Ruby exclaims. Watchdog. Get it, Uncle Bob? Not bad, Ruby. Not bad at all, I say. Ivan says it's going to rain buckets, says Ruby. She dips her trunk in the moat and blows bubbles. I think Ivan is onto something there. Did he show you his new picture? Ruby asks. She grabs a tuft of grass and tosses it in the air. I wish I could see it, but I can't because of that silly wall. But he told me all about it. My pal Ivan is quite the artist, just like Julia. Ivan sits up and nods towards a spot on the wall. Another mud mural, I ask. As any good dog knows, dirt plus water equals mud. And mud means mess. And mess means let's roll in this stuff and maybe dig a hole or two or 10. But for Ivan, mud plus a flat surface equals a waiting canvas. I crane my neck edging a bit farther down the top of the wall don't want to draw attention to myself. Hey, nice, I say. I mean, I'm not an art guy. To me, 
heart is a glop of spray cheese on a cheese dog with extra grated cheese on top. Still, I've always admired Ivan's work. It's, Ivan begins, nope, I say, don't tell me, let me guess. You always guess wrong, Ivan says, not always. You thought my palm tree was a dandelion. Art is in the eye of the beholder, I say. You thought my blackberries were giant ants. Kinyani ambles up to join in the conversation. And need I remind you that you thought his portrait of me was a chimpanzee with gas? The resemblance was striking, I say. Kinyani glares at me. She glares at me a lot. And this chapter is called On the Subject of Chimps. Probably I shouldn't have mentioned the chimp angle. Gorillas aren't as open-minded as dogs. A lot of them have a thing about chimps. I think they're clowns. But, I, but when I look at apes and gorillas, seems to me they have a lot more in common than they admit to. Dogs ain't perfect, but I'll tell you one thing where we rule, tolerance. For us, a dog is a dog is a dog. I see a Great Dane, I say howdy. I run into a puggle, it's glad to meet you. How's it going? Smelled any good pee today lately? Go to a dark dog park and you'll see. We are equal opportunity playful. You sniff my rear, I sniff yours. You don't see that with humans, obviously. Constantly seeing differences where none exist. All those things like skin color, dogs could care less. You think I won't hang with a Dalmatian cause he's spotted or a Sharpe cause she's wrinkled? I'm not saying I love every dog I meet. Snickers comes to mind. But I'll always give a dog the benefit of the doubt. Life is short, play is good, and there are plenty of tennis balls to go around. This chapter is called A Very Handsome Dog. Hi, Aunt Kenyana, Ruby calls. Once again, Ruby, says Kenyana, I am not your aunt. I am a primate, and you, my dear, are not. More's the pity. But if Ivan is my uncle, then you have to be my aunt, Ruby declares. Ahem, <clears throat> says Ivan, pointing to the wall. My painting, Bob? I consider. It looks like, like a dog? Ruby flaps her ears. I can tell she's trying very hard to stay quiet. Quiet. A very handsome dog, I add. Is it? It is, Ruby exclaims. It's your Uncle Bob. Uncle Ivan told me. But who's that? I ask, pointing to another set of mud strokes. I thought you needed a companion, says Ivan. I know you must get lonely at home by yourself all day. It's true but I've never mentioned that to Ivan. Guy's like a mind reader. I think Snickers and Bob would make a cute couple, says Ruby. I blink in disbelief. Bite your trunk. Ruby starts to reply, but her voice is drowned out by a sharp clap of thunder. Storm's getting close, said, says Kenyani. Ivan, dear, come on. You know how you hate the damp. It's true. He carries around old burlap bags so he won't have to sit on wet grass. Ivan looks at me sheepishly. She knows me so well. Kazoo, one of the baby gorillas, bounded over and leaps onto Ivan's back. Ivan loves all the youngsters, but Kazoo is his favorite. I think she reminds him of a, him a little of his twin sister, Tag, 
who died when she was still a baby. Ride, Kudzu commands. Julia appears, her backpack at the ready. Bob, she calls, we need to get going. Ride now, Kudzu repeats, yanking on one of Ivan's ears. Looks like it's time to go, says Ivan. Good to see you, buddy. Stay dry, okay? Will do, big guy. I turn to Kenyani. Enchanted as always, my dear. A trumpeting noise cuts through the air. Uh-oh, says Ruby. That's Aunt Akello. Akello, the oldest of the elephant aunts, lumbers over. Come on, Ruby. Weather's getting bad. Just one more minute, Ruby pleads. Now? But I need to tell Uncle Bob one more riddle. Now, Akello repeats. Nobody ever listens to the littlest elephant, Ruby complains. You can tell me the riddle next time, kiddo, I say, winking at Akello. Ruby brightens. Okay, gotta go or I'll be in big trouble. Love you, Uncle Bob. See you later, Uncle Ivan and Aunt Kenyani. I'm not your... Kenyani begins, but Ruby is already galloping back to her herd. And this chapter is called The Beginning. In the distance, thunder growls long and low and not giving up. Reminds me of my stomach pre-breakfast. I test the air. Weird. Something isn't right. Julia, it's George rushing over. Hurry up. You need to get inside. George has an odd scent, like he's on guard. I've only smelled it a few times on him. I look up. The clouds have turned strange shades of green and yellow and gray clustered together like rows of flat marshmallows. It's so ugly, it's beautiful. I can't stop looking. The air goes still like a cat before it leaps on its prey. Kenyani and Ivan and Kazoo are racing toward the gorilla villa. A fat raindrop hits my nose. It tastes wrong. How can rain taste dangerous? People are yelling, running, opening umbrellas, covering their heads with maps of the park. More drops. At the far end of the field, I can just make out a kello herding Ruby along. Another drop, a dry one, like a pebble. Hail, George says. Julia, now. He grabs her hand, rumbling. The sky boils and swirls. Bob, Julia calls, come on. I move to leap off my perch to run to Julia. I've done it a thousand times, but this time I lose my footing. I never slip. I'm as nimble as nutwit, but the rain, the hail, I let out a yelp as I land on Ivan's side of the wall, splat in the mud. Bob, Julia screams. He'll be okay, George says. I can smell Julia's fear and George's doubt as he drags her away. And this chapter is called Torn Apart. Noise. It's all noise. Noise that hurts. Noise like a massive truck bearing down on us, the power of its engine, the inescapable wheels, the relentless roar. Nothing to see, nothing even to smell. Just the terrible sound of the world disintegrating. This chapter is called No Way. I'm flying. And this chapter is called Airborne. 
not far, just into the nearby draft domain. Not high, just enough to buzz the tops of trees. Not long, just long enough to stop breathing. But I fly. I'm not alone. Half the world seems airborne. Trees, boards, bicycles, chunks of roofs, umbrellas, chairs, bits and pieces of life. It all levitates past like some horrible magic trick. Something hits my head. A toy truck, maybe? And I yelp in pain. And I'm terrified. So scared, I pee myself. And I'll be the first to admit it. You try it and see how dry your underwear stays. But still, I fly. Not like in the box, the box with my brothers and sisters. Not like with the owl. This is different. This is me, Bob the dog, spending a moment as Bob the bird. And this chapter is called Landing. It's over. I land. Oomph. Hard on my rear and slide to a stop directly underneath Stretch, the oldest giraffe in the place. The roar, and by now I've realized we're talking a real live tornado, vanishes as quickly as it came, leaving a vacuum, a silence that hurts even more than the noise. And this chapter is titled, Bad Dog. And this is why I'm a bad dog. Not bad dog like I chewed your favorite slippers, bad dog like I'm not a good representative of my species, of any species. I don't think, Ivan, Ruby, Julia, are they all right? I've got to find them. That's what a hero dog would do. One of those guys on the man's best friend show, hero dog dash into flames and dig into rubble. Hero dogs are fearless. Nope, not my style. What do I do? Bob, untamed, undaunted. I howl like a newborn puppy. And this chapter is called Honest. I'm not hurt, banged up a little, sure, but nothing major. And I don't howl for long, but it's what I do. Like I said, I ain't a saint, but at least I'm honest about my failings. And this chapter is called Stretch. Slowly, with some difficulty, Stretch peers down between his two front legs. His body partially shelters me from the rain. A piece of canvas has draped itself around his neck like an ugly scarf. I swallow my howls. We look at each other too, stunned, too stunned to form actual words. Finally, Stretch clears his throat. Hello, he says, in a strangely calm voice. What kind of animal might you be, if you don't mind my asking? Dog. Didn't think you guys flew. We don't, as a rule. I pick myself up, move out from under stretch, and take in my surroundings. The pelting rain has, sl has slowed some, and the wind has dulled. What was that? Stretch asks, trying and failing to yank the canvas off his impressive neck. Tornado, I think. I've seen tornadoes on the Weather Channel. They look like water swirling down a drain, if the water were black and full of trucks and trees. They looked like death. I gaze up at him. I have to crane my neck. You okay? Yep, 
says stretch, but from what I can see, a lot of other folks aren't. And this chapter is called Hard Barks. Across the way, I hear something, a small squeak. Who lives over there, I ask Stretch. The Aardvark family, he replies, lovely neighbors. Carefully, I venture across Stretch's domain. The sky is dark as dusk. I hear a flutter of wings overhead. It's Mitch, the mockingbird. He's missing some feathers. Bob, he calls, settling on a fence post. Was that you I saw up there? Yep. How are things looking? Not good. A lot of damage. Well, take care of yourself, I say. Likewise, he pauses to straighten a wayward feather. Little hint, by the way. Next time you fly, Try flapping your paws. I make my way over a broken wooden barrier, tiptoe over some scattered glass and twisted metal, cross the paved path and arrive at the aardvarks. More sounds. They're coming from what looks like a demolished keeper's shed. I hesitate, not sure what to do. It's a big mess and I'm a small guy. Also, my head hurts. I feel dazed, fuzzy. My ears are ringing. I yank off some small stray boards with my mouth. For the record, small stray boards have small stray nails in them. Underneath the boards are three shivering aardvarks two babies and a mom. They're strange looking, I gotta say, with their long piggy snouts and bunny ears. You good? I ask. Well, what was that? The mother manages to ask. Some seriously bad weather. Is it over? I consult the wind. Doubt it. You think everybody's okay? She asks. Don't know. Sure hope so. And then it hits me. Ivan, Ruby, Julia, George. Look, I gotta go, I say in a strangled voice. Any part of your indoor den survive? She nods. I think so. Go there, lie low. Where's Pedro? The littlest aardvark asks. I feel my head with a front paw. A nice bump is forming. Who's Pedro? Our keeper. He'll come, I promise. Are you sure? The baby asks. I'm sure, I say, but of course I'm lying. And this chapter is called Sounds. The eerie quiet doesn't last. Before long, the squeals and shrieks and brays and squawks of the animal kingdom crowd the air. Terror, confusion, pain. From far off comes the wailing of sirens, car alarms, blare from the parking lot. Now and then, people shout. Cries for help translate into any language, human or animal fish or fowl. Never want to hear those again. Never, ever. And this chapter is called Smells. And the smells, like I said, feelings have a scent. I figured I'd smelled pretty much everything there was to inhale in this big old world. But the smell of sheer terror of helplessness, of blood, of broken bones, of torn wings. Well, turns out there are a whole lot of smells I've never encountered. Didn't know how lucky 
I've been. And this chapter is called Surveying the Damage. I pick my way past the devastation. The tornado has left a random path of misery. The African aviary is gone, simply gone. The kids farm nearby, untouched. Although there are some very flustered chickens clucking like all get out from the safety of their hen house. I see few people, hopefully a lot of potential visitors were scared off by the threatening weather. It looks like some of the animals listened to their early warning systems. Those little voices inside telling them something bad was coming their way. Quite a few seem to have taken cover before the brunt of the storm. Wish I'd paid more, to, more attention to my own internal weatherman. I passed the penguin viewing window, the one that allows visitors to watch their graceful swimming. Several penguins are underwater, swooping and swiveling. Joe, Jim, I call, and they both swim over. Bird okay, I ask. Baby Bert pops his little head out of the water. Hey, Bob, did you know we're having a storm? Yeah, I noticed. All good here, Bob, Joe says. You? Yep, took a little flight, though. Daddy, says Bert, can I fly? In the air? Nope, says Joe. You fly underwater. You're a penguin. Bob flew, and he's a dog. Bob is a very special dog, says Joe. And he gives me a look, a grown-up, just-between-us look that says, we're all right, but what about the others? And this chapter is called Baby Sloth. I say goodbye to the penguins and continue on my way. So much has simply vanished. Walls, fences, barriers, netting. The orderly world of the park with its careful lines defining territory isn't so defined anymore. Many of the habitats are still entirely intact, but not all. What will this place be without fences and walls. You didn't need to watch the Nature Channel to know that certain animals like to eat certain other animals. I passed two squirrel monkeys swinging happily from the children's carousel. <clears throat> a pelican watches from her perch on a popcorn stand. I see a camel and a zebra together looking stunned be standing side by side. I notice a red lemur, Merlin, on a picnic table. Lemur eyes are always big, if you ask me, but Merlin's eyes look like they're about to pop right out of his head. I make my way through splintered wood and glass shards and approach the gift shop. It's roofless. Stuffed toy animals are scattered here and there, like they tried to make a break for it. And I love koala's t-shirt dangles from a tree branch. Around a corner, I see a baby sloth, Sylvia, I think her name is. She's resting on a muddy, plush, plush draft. Hey there, I say. She makes a tiny noise, a sloth sob, I guess it is. Let's find your mom and dad. I'm not one for hugging and licking and such, but I give her a little nudge with my nose. Sylvia somehow manages to grab the draft and looks up at me like she expects to hitch a ride. How the heck do you pick up a baby sloth? Not exactly part of my job description and sloths are so, you know, slothy. Carefully, I pick her up by her scruff, the way you do with a puppy. She puts that silly toy in her mouth and off we go.
takes a few minutes, but I find her mom, Selma. I deposit Sylvia on a patch of wet grass. How can I thank you, Selma cries. No biggie, I say, and I head on with fear in my belly and the odd taste of sloth fur in my mouth. And this chapter is called Make No Sudden Moves. I've ridden around the grounds of the park in Julia's backpack enough to know every inch of the place. I've even chatted with many of the residents, but now everything is topsy-turvy. I keep finding myself in places I don't want to be, like the wolf exhibit. Near the entrance, a sign lies crushed on the ground. It has a picture of a gray wolf with an arrow pointing one way and another arrow with an emperor penguin on it. To my right, I see a piece of hay stuck deep in a tree trunk like a pencil in a cupcake. To my left, water gushes from a path side ditch, a broken pipe. The boiling sky has settled into a solid blanket of gray and the rains quieted to a steady drizzle. Still, I smell more bad weather menacing in the distance. Tossed into a bush, is a large informational display with a photo of two gray wolves. I don't see any fence or barrier or intact wall. And it dawns on me that grumpy wolves and tiny dogs might not make the best of pals, especially under these trying circumstances. Just as I start to leave, a wolf on the sign seems to move. Blink. Oh, he isn't part of the sign. He's next to the sign. It's Kimu. Hey, I say. No answer. Something tells me I should hightail it out of there. Something else is saying, make no sudden moves. I hate it when my brain disagrees with itself. I split the difference, crouching meekly, doing the whole submissive dog thing. Kimu locks his gaze on me. I try not to make direct eye contact. A lot of animals find that threatening, but his eyes are mesmerizing, glowing amber in way too smart. He moves again. Two paws appear. Big paws, nothing like my feeble shrimpy feet. These paws are the size of hamburger buns. Hamburger buns with lethal claws attached. And this chapter is called Mutt versus wolf. I wait for him to launch into his pounce. Maybe if I time my escape just right? Yeah, sure. In a battle of Chihuahua mutt versus wolf, even I wouldn't bet on the dog. Do they break your neck before they eat you? That only seems fair. My heart's doing this crazy tap dance in my chest, and I wonder if he can hear it. I sneak a peek at him. <laughs> Strangely, he just keeps staring at me. Quickly, I advert my gaze. Those eyes, those chilling, dangerous eyes. It's me, Bob, I say. Kimu says nothing. He's panting hard. Maybe he's disoriented, even hurt. I try to speak again. My voice seems to be hiding somewhere deep in my throat. Another try. Um, Kimu, 
He blinks. Are you all right? No response. Anyone else hurt? I ask. This time he seems to hear me. I don't know. His voice is a low whisper. Can I help? I ask, really hoping the answer is no. Suzu, I can't find her. All right then, I say. I'll, uh, I'll take a look. I poke around a bit, careful not to get too close to Kimu. A sour smell pours off him like sweat off a human. I don't, I don't see her, I say after a few minutes, but I'm sure she's fine. Just a little shook up, probably, hiding somewhere. He doesn't answer. I should go. Um, um, looking for some friends, I say. Is there anything else I can do? He looks up at the ominous sky as if there's an answer waiting there. I don't know, he says. I don't know. I don't know. And the last chapter I'll read for today is called Gorilla World. I move on. I have to find my friends. Have to. But where am I? I leap over another mangled signpost with bent arrows. One way to Reptileville, one way to Lionland. I pass the man mangrove swamp. A manatee pokes up her big head, draped with Spanish moss like a silly wig. Two workers in yellow raincoats trot past me. One has a bloody bandit on his cheek. I need to stop, regroup, cool it, Bob, I tell myself. I'm panicking, not taking in the right data. I try to blot out all the horrible smells, all the awful noise. I concentrate, let my nose do the real work. A whiff of something familiar, gorilla? has to be gorilla. Full run now. I cut my back left paw on a shard of glass. Trip. Fall hard on my nose and cut it too. Dripping blood. I carry on. Find them. Find them. Find them. A massive old oak lies on its side at the entrance to Gorilla World. Huge tangled roots grope into the air like frozen snakes. And just beyond where Ivan lives is nothing but devastation. Thank you for listening.